Last time there was a question, what are the units for the quark masses? Was uh, mega electron volt divided by C square, which sounds like very strange unit for the mass. But maybe I explain why it comes that way. We know that for particles that have very small masses, well, generally for any particles, you have the relationship between mass and energy. If any mass will move at the speed of light, would have this energy. Uh, so if you look at this one, you can put the same equation to the form E divided by C square, and then this explains this mass, mega electron volt, which is a unit for energy divided by C square. But of course, this doesn't give you any intuition what it may mean. That's why I put you what the unit really is. So one mega electron volt divided by C square is 1.8 times 10 to minus 30 kilogram. Okay. Of course, it's good to know what is the mass of other particles. So proton and neutron, both of them have the same mass of 1.7 times 10 to minus 27 kilogram. So you see that the mass of the lightest quark is approximately equal to this one. It's around 1,000 times smaller than proton. So it's similar to the mass of electron. But for the heavy quark, this is around 1,000 times larger than the mass of the proton, Three, maybe 100 times larger than the mass of the proton. Then you can ask me if then proton or neutron are made of three quarks of such small mass, right? If the mass of single quark is so small and the mass of the proton is 1,000 times larger, should be 12 times larger, something like this, where is the mass coming from? Uh, the mass is not only in the separated quark, but the mass is also in the interaction between the two quarks. So the interaction energy can be transformed into mass too. So the real mass of the proton comes from the interaction between the small particles, not from the particles of quark separated. Okay, finish this topic, go further. Sometimes these electromagnetic waves are just called photons and we will try to explain what it really means. Last time we said that there are four different types of interactions, gravitational, electromagnetic, weak and strong. And now how the real interaction is happening, I didn't say, but maybe we should say a few words. If we have one body here and another body here and we say that these two bodies interact, it really means that one of the bodies sends a particle, a carrier particle, force <coughs> carrier particle, to the other one, and this one sends a particle to the other one. And they kind of exchange particles and interact that way. So in the case when this interaction is electromagnetic interaction, the particle that goes between the two bodies is photon. 
So we should also say what are the particles in the other cases for the strong interactions. These particles are called gluons. For the weak interactions, these particles are called W and Z bosons. And for the gravitational one, I put it in the parenthesis. It's called graviton. Why I put it in the parenthesis? Because this is hypothetical. Hypothetical means people think it exists, but nobody ever seen it. And there are some theories saying that we will never see it because it's... Mm -hmm. I read some arguments saying that we need a laboratory of the size of the Jupiter, of the one of the big planets, to find these gravitons. But the noise would be much larger than the gravitons effect. So we are not able to observe it any, never, probably. Anyway, this is just on the side. Today we will be discussing the electromagnetic waves that sometimes are called photons and I will say in a moment when they are called photons. So first, when you have an electromagnetic wave, you have the direction where it goes, some x, and you have the electric field and the magnetic field changing like a sinusoid that way. There are a few things that define this. First one is the amplitude. Second part is the wavelength. The amplitude is not really important for us, but what is really important is the wavelength. So for the electromagnetic waves, we can make a picture. Starting with the wavelength, so the distance between two next maxima. Starting with very large numbers, and the large number in our case would be 10 centimeters. And this type of electromagnetic waves of such a long wavelength are called radio waves. Many of you may know this already, but let's just systematize it. So it turns out that these radio waves are too large to interact with atoms and molecules. They interact with larger object, objects. We have to go to smaller waves. So the next range will finish at one millimeter. And this would be the microwaves. It turns out that microwaves already interact with molecules. And what the microwaves do to molecules, they make them rotate very fast. So that's how the microwave oven is working. 
You have a molecule and the microwave turns it first one direction and then another direction. So it's very fast moving like that, every water molecule for example. And finally when it's moving like that, this rotating movement of one water and another water makes the collision and the temperature goes up very high. So that's how the microwaves are really working. The next range finishing at approximately one micrometer. Maybe we should say a few words about these small numbers. One meter, everybody knows what it is. Then we have one centimeter. <coughs> that is 10 to minus 2 meter. Then we have one millimeter. That is 10 to minus 3 meter. Then we have one micrometer that is 10 to minus 6 meter. So this everybody knows but millimeter. Micrometer. What is the next on the list? Nanometer? Okay. N M. Which is ten to minus nine meter. And it's nanometer. And I guess everybody knows the word nano because that's one of the most popular words recently. Nanotechnology and so on and so on. What is the next one? Can you say louder? Answer. Yes, good. So the next one on our list would be something written that way and this is for the Danish letter O or from the it was the first letter of the guy who invented this unit and his name was Ongström but everybody in the world is usually saying this Angström so you can follow either either way but the Danish one would be Ongström and this is This is 10 to minus 10 meter. And the next one? One PM, which is called picometer. Ah, this was called angstrom. which is equal to 10 to minus 12. Okay, as you see, 3, 6, 9, 12, with the one exception of the 10. This is going every 3, 3, 3, but there is one exception of 10 to minus 10 that is between. Why? Why do we need one more unit? Yeah, exactly, because it's very convenient. This is the very good unit for measuring the size of atom. Instead of saying 120 picometers, you can say 1.2 angstrom. And that's generally what you need. There are smaller units and higher units, but you are not going to use it in this class. So we have microwaves and here between one millimeter and between one micrometer you have something what is called infrared. Infrared waves, they're often just denoted in the abbreviation as IR.
Of course, the IR should be here. IR stands for IR, infrared. Infrared means larger than red. And why larger than red, we are going to see in a moment. Okay, then you have very, very narrow range. And this is the visible light. sometimes denoted by people as VIS. Very, very narrow range. We are going to discuss it in a moment. Then you have the next one, going up to 100 nanometers. These are called Ultra violet. And very often this is denoted by UV. I guess all the girls in the class know what UV is because it's on the creams when you buy for sun burning or not getting sun burn. Under UV, finishing at one picometer, you have X-rays. Then you have 0 0.1 picometer, you have something what is called gamma rays. And shorter wavelength is a cosmic radiation. Now, we want to know how all of this radiation is interacting with the matter, with atoms and with molecules. And I already said that the microwaves make the molecule rotate. Atom cannot rotate. Atom is a point. So atom is not reacting really here, but the molecule would rotate. Infrared is going the molecule to vibrate. So, for example, if you have water molecule, oxygen, with two hydrogen attached, and if you put microwave to it, the water will start rotating. But if you put infrared to it, the hydrogens start bouncing like that. And that's not only the movement, another, they start moving the size of movement like that. So the infrared, or IR, interacts with vibrations in molecules. Visible light and ultraviolet, these two interact with electron inside the molecule. So what happens to electrons? Electrons change levels. Turns out that not every energy in molecule is allowed for the electron. So what happens if you put visible or ultraviolet light on the electron, it's changing one level to another level. X-rays interacts with the nuclei, with the points where the protons and neutrons are. So with the X-ray, you can make a picture of the position of the nuclei. And the gamma rays interacts with something what is inside proton, inside nuclei, so with single protons or with single neutrons. So all of these waves can be used to probe 
molecules and atoms, and they are very important. Now a few words about the visible light. If I take this small part, and I write it here, turns out that this visible light starts with a red color on one side. And on the other side, there is violet. This explains you why this light on this side, next to the red, is called infrared. And that explains you why the light on this side is called ultraviolet. They are just neighbors. Okay? And if you want to have all the colors, you just go to your book. And you see that it starts with red, then goes to orange, yellow, green, blue, and finishes at violet. All the range. What other quantities are defined for these waves? Next one would be the frequency. And the frequency is written by the Greek letter nu. So it's not W like that, but it's something that should look something like that. Okay. And this is the frequency. And frequency is defined by equation as the speed of light divided by the wavelength. We can go to the next properties. And the next property would be the energy. So energy of light is defined as H nu, where H is a constant called Planck constant. And it's equal to 6.626 times 10 to minus 34 joule times second. It's a very small number. And generally, the number joule is not very often used in quantum theory because it's too big. Joule is good for boiling one kilogram of water, but not for the energy of one electron. So very often, people are using one electron volt, which is a unit of energy for electron and the difference of potentials one volt. That is equal to 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 joule. This is much better a unit for describing electron. So before we are dis discussing the mass of quarks in mega electron volts, so similar unit, but you see that if you use just this, you would have to use some strange, very small number of joules. Okay, you have the Planck constant and you can calculate the energy of a single photon. Uh, if we calculate momentum, we want to use the normal mass, normal equation P times velocity, uh, sorry, mass times equal P, equal mass times velocity. Unfortunately, we cannot. The problem is that the electromagnetic waves, particles, photons, they have mass zero. So the momentum would be zero. So we cannot use this 
equation. Turns out that the correct equation for this zero mass particle is just E divided by C. Sorry, mistake. H divided by this, which is E by C. It's, it's still the same, but should be that way. Now, what is the problem with the electromagnetic wave being a wave and photon being a particle? There was a guy, his name was De Broil. It postulated that every particle and every wave is the same. It means that every photon is at the same time a particle moving like a wave. So every electron is at the same time an object, a ball that is moving, and at the same time it's a wave. It means that each of us, me, you, or you, we are at the same time objects that we have mass and we have volume, at the same time we are waves. It's difficult to imagine and turns out that for big bodies, especially my I guess, uh, the wavelength is extremely short and it's impossible to, to find it. So you should understand that every object is at the same time particle and wave and sometimes, sometimes it prefers to be wave but sometimes it prefers to be a particle. So now what is the rule? If the mass of the object is very, very small, usually it's wave. When the mass of the object is very large, usually it's particle. What does it mean usually? It means that if you do two different experiments with the same particle, sometimes you observe it as a particle, but sometimes you observe it as a wave. This is called the Broil wave particle duality. And it's one of the very important steps into a science that we are going to discuss for the next few classes that is called quantum mechanics. The next very important rule is so-called Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And this Heisenberg ascendancy principle says that if you have any object and you are measure position, you are making some error. This is the error in measuring position of the object. And if you multiply the error in measuring position by the error in measuring the momentum, 
of this object. So in other words, in measuring the speed of this object, this error will be always larger or equal to 4, uh, 1 over 2. 1 over 2 and h was defined here. So this one is a small number. It's approximately 10 to minus 34 <coughs> joule times second. If you play with this a bit, you find that it is 10 to minus 34 meter times uh, kilogram what would be the units kilograms times meter by second so this is the error you are making in meters, and this is the error you are making in this, uh, in this unit. Now we should understand what it really means. Let's do some examples. Let's assume that error we'll be making here, and the error we'll be making here is kind of similar size. If this is true, then we have Delta X would be around 10 to minus 17 meter and Delta P would be around 10 to minus 17 kilogram times meter per square. Sometimes, of course, this error can be different. We, we can better measure speed than position or opposite. But let's say we have some apparatus which gives similar accuracy. OK, so let's, let's just analyze. First, we analyze one gram ball moving <coughs> with speed equal one centimeter per second. So very slow. You can think it's this chalk moving one centimeter per second, more or less this speed. So now, when we look at this one, we see the position here and the speed one centimeter per second. And this theorem, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, tell us that we are making mistake in measuring the position and the mistake in measuring the velocity or momentum. Let's calculate what are the values of the velocity and momentum. So you see that if you calculate P equal in this case M times V, you are going to get 10 to minus 5 kilogram times meter by second. At the same time, the position, and, and of course this is plus, minus, uh, 10 to minus 17 kilogram times meter by second. Now, if we measure the position, probably we can distinguish every millimeter the position. So the position would be, let's say, 5 millimeters, which is 0. Point, um, I write it as a 10 to minus 3 meter, plus minus 10 to minus 17 meter. We see that the error we are making is really, really small comparing to this, the value we found. So 12, 12 orders of magnitude smaller and here the order is 14 orders of magnitude smaller. So we can say everything about the position and the speed of this ball at the same time. It means that for big objects moving slowly it doesn't really matter. Let's see what happens 
if we try to use this one for some small objects. Small object would be the This is the TV in the old style. So in the old style, the TV had this lamp like that. When you had some electrodes and the electrons were shoot toward the screen and then they hit every point, making a light on the screen. So this is the old type of TV set. So we are taking one electron that is traveling from here to the screen and hitting the screen. Usually in the TV set, the, the difference of voltage is 20,000 volts. So then you can find that the kinetic energy of this electron is 20,000 electron volt. And we can calculate the momentum of the electron. Electron has mass, so there is not a problem calculating just using this formula. You can calculate the momentum of the electron and we find that the momentum of the electron is 7.6 times 10 to minus 23 kilogram times meter by second. Mm, so this is already a small number. So now when we are making a mistake of this order, you see that the mistake is six, one million times larger than the speed. So this is definitely wrong, wrong apparatus. We have to change. So okay, let's change. Let's say we can measure the speed with the accuracy plus minus 10 to minus 25 kilogram per meter by second. We have some better apparatus, but this theorem saying that this error multiplied by the error in position must be larger than this. Then we found that the position of the electron in any moment is some number that we can calculate plus minus, if you plug this, 10 to minus 9 meter. Oh, this is already considerably large. If you think about this size, this is larger than atoms, 10 times larger than atoms, maybe 5 times larger than atoms. So it means that if we are able to measure the speed of the electron, we are not able to say more than the electron is here, but where, we have no idea. So with objects with very small mass, like the electron has, this uncertainty principle starts to be really important because we cannot find really the position of the position of the electron. We can only say it's between here, but we don't know how big error we are making here, where it exactly is. Okay, this also answers, this uncertainty principle answers why electrons never fell down on the nucleus in the atom. You probably may think about that, that if you have atom and inside there is highly charged positive nucleus and around these are the electrons moving around with the negative charge, negative and positive should attract each other. So finally the electron should go inside the proton. And there are some problems? What is the 25 from? Okay. Uh, so that, okay. First I took this 34 and I just divided democratically into 17, 17. That's a way of measuring one and second. But if I'm using this way of measurement to our experiment, then I find that the error is one million times larger than than, um, than my results. So I removed this one. I found, I built a new apparatus 
that the error in the position and the error in the momentum would be 10 to minus 25 and 10 to minus 9. Okay. Together, they still give you the same number, but now I'm making very small mistake here, but big mistake here. But I need it, otherwise I never get this correctly. And why I choose 25? Because this is around 1% of this number. If I choose here 26, that would be 8, even larger error here. I try to keep both of the errors small. So 25 was some trade-off between these two. Okay, coming back to the atom. The negative charge and positive charge are attracting each other. So you may think that this electron going around may fall down on the nucleus. Uh -huh. But the nucleus is very small, very small, 10 to minus 15. If you have the electron inside nucleus in the area of 10 to minus 15, then the error you can make for momentum would be 10 to minus 19 and turns out that this is a huge error, huge momentum for electron and the electron inside atom doesn't have such energy. So in other words, it's the uncertainty principle that tells us that electron cannot go to such small volume because if it is in such small volume, the error in the momentum would be huge. And it means that the, uh, and the energy would be too large in the atom and electron in the atom doesn't have such big energy. Okay. So as you see, the world of, in the small scale is a bit strange. It doesn't really follow our intuition, something what we learned. This uncertainty principle telling us that at the same time we cannot find position and momentum has very strong consequences. There is another version of this uncertainty principle saying that time and energy error what does it mean time and energy error imagine this when I have one body going and hitting this body, transferring energy, the total energy is constant. But this equation saying that the total energy doesn't have to be constant, there can be error, if the time is short. So in very short time, the energy con conservation rule is not correct. So last time we were saying that the quarks are heavy and lighter and we said that always they go to the lower energy quarks, never going to the higher energy quarks. But this uncertainty principle is telling you that it can go to higher energy but only for a very short time, then it has to come back. Okay, everything, now we start quantum mechanics. So what we said is in the classical mechanics, you can have the position and the speed of any object defined with any accuracy you want. But in quantum mechanics, you have this uncertainty principle telling you that when you measure position and the speed, you make errors. So people find you cannot find at the same moment speed 
and position. You can find only speed or you can find only position, but never both. That's why they started defining instead of defining position and velocity of the object they said that let's have another object and this object is called wave function and having wave function we can define any property of the system we want just using operators and you will understand it in a moment we are going to create this wave function for electrons in some special CA situations and you will see it is not very difficult the way to find wave function for any object is to solve Schrodinger equation again German letter U Schrödinger so we have the Schrödinger equation is saying that the energy operator acting on the wave function gives you the energy of the molecule multiplied by the wave function back now I defined what it is. This is the energy operator. This is the wave function. And this is the energy. Now, from mathematical point of view, this is just a number. These two, or the wave function, it's a function, very complicated function usually, extremely complicated function. And H is an operator. It's difficult to explain to you what operator means but you can think it's a function that acts on functions example it starts with a number and gives you a number for example the function sine defined for pi gives you zero so you start with a number finish at the number operator it's a function well it's yes that's correct we're saying it's a function that starts with a function and gives you function Here was example. Here we have another example. I'm sure you know the differentiation. D over dx. This is operator. Operator acts on function. For example, the function would be, uh, we define a function of x. Equal four x square plus two x plus one. 
and we say that this operator acts on function x and it gives you d over dx of this one for x squared plus 2x plus 1 which is of course 8x plus 2 and this in fact you think that it is another function g so in other sense the operator takes one function and give you other function at the end so normal function is operating on a number and gives you number operator operates on function and gives you back function but of course this is a very simple operator the operators in Schrodinger equation are usually much more complicated and we are going to go now there to see the more complicated operators First, H is the operator or total energy. And you know the total energy is the kinetic energy plus potential energy. So we have that that's the operator for the kinetic energy plus the operator for the potential energy now you know that the kinetic energy is the momentum square divided by 2 m mass is just a number but momentum is operator now we have to know what operator it really is by the way what time is it how much time we have ah we have minus 10 minutes okay next class will be shorter 10 minutes i only tell you what is the momentum operator and we finish this moment so momentum operator in quantum mechanics is given by I where I is imaginary unit it's H bar or maybe I write it differently as H divided by 2 pi and then you have the differentiation so we make px over px somebody may ask me what is the difference between this and this and I can explain next class thank you for today so next class we are going to use these equations to solve Schrodinger equations for few simple cases and we start solving for atom that is very difficult case okay. thank you